as we mentioned before, it is particularly to be seen, Lord of the Rings, as a meditation on the relationship between grace and free will. This pops up several times, very non, non-obtrusively, shall we say, if you know what you're looking for. So, for instance, when uh, Gandalf says to Frodo, one thing is certain, uh, Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker. That's an intimation of the divine will, you say. Uh, one can make the argument that the most realistic, uh, in the sense of grace versus providence, the most realistic occurrence in the book is in fact, and this is a spoiler, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know how it ends, fast forward or turn to something else. But in the end, Frodo fails the quest. It's Gollum who succeeds in it. It's Gollum who saves the world. Now, mind you, Gollum does so for his own horrible reasons, not for anything good, and doubtless he is damned, but he does save the world. And why is he there to save the world? Because Frodo showed pity, as Bilbo had earlier, showed pity on him and didn't kill him. Had he not done that earlier on, then Frodo would have failed and the the world would have been taken over by Sauron. But that didn't happen. And it is the way things tend to be in life. God rides straight with crooked lines. Uh, Another example is in the appendices where Gandalf is talking at one point about how uh, he had come to hire Bilbo as a a, um, burglar to help the dwarves get uh, get smog put out of the way. He goes on a long uh, long thought about what it would have been like had smog not been killed and all the terrible things that would have happened. Uh, ending with the, uh, ending with the line, uh, perhaps dra- uh, dragon fire and Lorien and no queen and Gondor. And then he says, but none of that came to pass because I happened to meet, uh, Thor and Oaken Shield at the Bree, at the inn at Bree one night, a chance meeting, as we say in Middle Earth. But of course, it's precisely on such chance meetings that human history hangs. Now, when you look at Lord of the Rings, as I say, it has a it is a very Catholic uh, work. Tolkien thought so as much himself, as I as I said earlier. Uh, he um, uh, wrote to a uh, he wrote to a lady back in uh, 25 October 1958. Far greater things may color the mind in dealing with the lesser things of a fairy story. So, just to give you a couple of examples of things that are in the Lord of the Rings that are very specifically Catholic. The Blessed Sacrament, and he makes the uh, he makes the uh, comment to a son of his, uh, his son Christopher, uh, quote, "I myself am convinced by the Petrine claims. Nor looking around the world does there seem much doubt which, if Christianity is true, is the true Church, the temple of the Spirit, dying but living, corrupt but holy, self-reforming and re-arising." But for me, that church in which the Pope is the acknowledged head on earth has his chief claim that it is the one that has and still does ever defended the blessed sacrament and given it most honor and put, as Christ plainly intended, in the prime place. Feed my sheep was his last charge to St. Peter. And since his words are always first to be understood literally, I suppose him to refer primarily to the bread of life. It was against this that the Western European revolt or reformation was really launched, the blasphemous fa- uh, fable of the mass, and faith slash works a mere red herring, end of quote. So if you look, uh, and he's written much else to the same degree in his letters about the Blessed Sacrament as being the 
the center of all that's good and true and beautiful. Well, you see the Blessed Sacrament uh, foreshadowed since in his myth, the world of Lord of the Rings is in our world, but a long time ago, prior to the coming of Christ. Uh, you see an echo of the Blessed Sacrament in the way bread of the elves, Lembas, which, again, quote, had a potency that increased as travelers relied on it alone and did not mingle it with other foods. It fed the will, and it gave strength to endure, which reminds us very much of all the Eucharistic miracles, and particularly of people like uh, St. Lidwin, St. Francis Borgia, and Teresa Neumann, who lived off only the Blessed Sacrament. Now, another place that you'll see, another area of Catholic life that you will see in Lord of the Rings, uh, foreshadowed again in that sense of Middle Earth, that world being before ours, is the veneration of Blessed Mary, Blessed Virgin Mary. So, as an example, he wrote to Father Robert Murray uh, about, quote, Our Lady, upon which all my own small perception of beauty, both in majesty and simplicity, is founded. Well, the Virgin Mary is perhaps somewhat reflected by Galadriel, the uh, Queen of Lorien, but particularly in the figure of Elbereth, the queen of the, the real high queen of the elves, one of the Valar, uh, to whom the elves, well, for want of a better word, sing hymns. So, by way of comparison, uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, I guess you could say, elven hymns to Elbereth. Snow white, snow white, O lady clear, O queen beyond the western seas, O light to us that wander here amid the world of woven trees. Gilfaniel, O Elbereth, clear are thy eyes and bright thy breath. Snow white, snow white, we sing to thee in a far land beyond the sea. O stars that in the sunless year with shining hand by her were sown. In windy fields now bright and clear, we see her silver blossom blown. O Elbereth Gilfaniel, we still remember we who dwell in this far land beneath the trees, thy starlight on the western seas. And that reminds us very, very much of the hymn by John Lingard, which Tolkien very definitely knew. Hail, Queen of Heaven, the ocean star, guide of the wanderer here below. Throne on life's surge, we claim thy care. Save us from peril and from woe. Mother of Christ, star of the sea, pray for the wanderer, pray for me. Sojourners in this vale of tears, to thee, blessed advocate, we cry. Pity our sorrows, calm our fears, and soothe with hope our misery. Refuge in grief, star of the sea, pray for the mourner, pray for me. The... Um, the amazing truth is that that kind of Catholicity really, really leaked into, uh, into uh, Tolkien's entire consciousness. Now, although it's quite true that the struggle between Gandalf and Denethor reminds one of the struggles between different popes and kings in days gone past, it also should be remembered that in Catholic history, and especially in Catholic folklore, the memory of great kings was very, very important. Uh, king Arthur, Charlemagne, St. Ferdinand, St. Louis, uh, these were held to be the ideal prototype for a ruler. Pious, brave, wonderful, and so on. Uh, there are three characters in Lord of the Rings who occupy the same position for the people of uh, and elves and dwarves of that area, of that time, Elendil, Gilgalad, and Durin. And the, uh, the, uh, the uh, dirges, you might say, the elegies that Tolkien writes for them are something that could have been written for any of these real world folk. For Gilgalad, Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing. 
the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. And then for uh, the dwarves, the world was young, the mountains green, no stain yet on the moon was seen. No words were laid on stream or stone when Durin woke and walked alone. The world was fair, the mountains tall, in elder days before the fall of mighty kings and Nagarond, Nothgarond, and Gondolin, who now beyond western seas have passed away. The world was fair in Durin's day. Well, you hear that, that yearning, that echoing in an awful lot of real medieval Catholic poetry with which Tolkien was very, very familiar. Um, but as one knows, that medieval synthesis was destroyed by the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the French and succeeding revolutions. And the, those forces of modernity, if you like, uh, Tolkien really didn't care for. <laughs> and so in the, uh, in the Hobbit, he speaks, says to the goblins that, quote, they invented some of the machines that have since troubled our world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once, for wheels and engines and explosions have always delighted them. And then, of course, the, uh, the scouring of the Shire is kind of a, uh, kind of an attack on what he saw as modernity. But there's a lot more that you can, uh, you can pull out of uh, Tolkien in terms of our actual history. Uh, so, for instance, the Dunny Dane come to Middle Earth after the Second Age. They set up the two monarchies of Gondor and Arnor, Arnor the North, Gondor the South. By the time Lord of the Rings starts, Arnor is no longer having broken into pieces and then been overwhelmed, although there's the, the memory of it and the hope that it will come again. Gondor is much smaller than it was. It's constantly under, uh, under siege by forces from the south and east. Well, in a lot of ways, this is reminiscent, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, of the Roman Empire, Rome. The Western Roman Empire collapsed under the barbarians and became a, but a memory, uh, which in turn would be restored by Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire. But the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, Byzantium, like Gondor, survived until finally it was, uh, again at the time of our story, uh, about to be overwhelmed by its southern and eastern enemies. But he does something very interesting here. Now, I mentioned this before on an earlier show, but it's, it's worth... Remembering, he takes a very, very specific, um, how do I put it, a very specific event, the siege of Minas Tirith, which starts out very much like the siege of Constantinople, which resulted in the end of the Byzantine Empire, the last of Eastern Rome. Uh, and the, the, his descriptions of the earlier part of the siege of uh, Minas Tirith very much like the siege of Constantinople in 1453. But then it flips. In 1683, the also imperial capital of Vienna was being also besieged by the Turks. But rather than falling, they were rescued literally at the 11th hour by the arrival of the Polish troops from the north under King Jan Sowiecki. All unlooked for. When it looked as though the Turks would break through the, uh, the walls and end the siege, they heard the bugles of the Poles, and everything changed. The siege was broken, and they were driven off. Something very similar happens in Lord of the Rings, the siege of Minas Tirith. The, uh, the Poles come flying southward. Uh, sorry, not the Poles. The Rohirrim, the people of Rohan, come south. Rohan has come, they say, in, in the city when they hear the bugles blowing. And the orcs, instead of the Turks, are pushed back, and the city is saved. Uh, as a result of that victory and the destruction of the ring, another interesting bit of Catholic historical imagination takes place. 
I'm referring here and now to the figure of Aragorn, who's a very, very interesting character. During most of their time, the Dunedain are the descendants of the Numenoreans are in the north, dispossessed, wanderers. And their leader, the heir to the throne of both kingdoms, Arnor and Gondor, is Aragorn. In the first part of the books, he's like any dispossessed royal prince from uh, Catholic history. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, various other figures in French, Spanish, and Portuguese history who uh, tried unsuccessfully to regain the thrones of their fathers. But in Middle-earth, in Middle-earth, the good old cause triumphs. And so Aragorn ends up crowned king of both Gondor and Arnor. And in this, he becomes very much like Charlemagne. But a Charlemagne who's not simply king of a restored or emperor of a restored uh, empire in the West, but one who manages to unite both, reunite both East and West into one great nation again, as though uh, Charlemagne had somehow managed to combine the Holy Roman Empire and Byzantium. You see, Aragorn's triumph, like so much in Lord of the Rings, is a triumph that is beyond uh, what we see in history as a rule. But going as Aragorn does from Bonnie Prince Charlie to um, uh, Charlemagne, Aragorn gives us an ideal of a, of a Catholic monarch who restores all things. Uh, there are a lot of other ways you could look at um, you could look at Lord of the Rings in terms of these sorts of motifs. Uh, the Dark Lord Sauron can represent modernity, but he can also, in a sense, symbolize Islam. Uh, the figure of the Dark Lord is very much like the figure of Mahound in Chesterton's the poem Lepanto. Uh, it's always in, uh, in Tolkien's world, the dangers to civilized Middle Earth come from the East and the South. Uh, so that was true for Europe in, uh, when she was Christendom. The Mongols from the East or the Arabs and then the Turks from the South. Always the two, the two uh, dangerous areas for Christendom. The... Um, the thing to bear in mind, too, however, is that The Lord of the Rings is not a, not a work to be seen in isolation. It is a Catholic work. As, uh, as Tolkien wrote to uh, Father Murray, quote, Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. And kind of, I mentioned this earlier, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. And as you read the book, as you go through it, uh, try to pick up on these clues yourself. The uh, think of think yourself of the um, traditional Catholicism with which Tolkien was so imbued, and see what you can find. Reread it. But reread it with a Catholic mindset. Uh, remember, there are all kinds of, of symbols that Catholics have used that he himself uses. I'll just give you one more example. Uh, Minas Tirith, the Tower of God, can be seen as a symbol of the church militant. It could be seen as the, the Res Publica Christiana, as it was called in the old days. Uh, as might, for instance, the, the um, gathering of the elves, the dwarves, the men, etc., uh, at Rivendell to launch forth on the quest. 
sort of a reminder of the various holy leagues in Catholic history that pulled together disparate forces to try to fend off the enemy. Uh, the Holy League of 1571, for instance, that gave us Lepanto, kind of foreshadowed. The thing is that Tolkien, Tolkien's work is filled with something that's particularly true in anything in Catholicism. You see, what the Lord of the Rings really reflects is, in essence, the Catholic worldview. And when we say the Catholic worldview, what do we mean by that? Well, the sacramental worldview, the realization that fallen nature can be redeemed by divine grace, and that divine grace works through very physical things, specifically the sacraments. Uh, and with that, in the, the I think it's, it's fair to say, that the dominant note of the Catholic liturgy, for example, is an intense longing, a longing for heaven. And this is true for her art, for the Catholicism literature, for everything to do with Catholicism, a longing for things that cannot be in this world, unearthly truth, unearthly purity, unearthly justice, unearthly beauty. And by all these earmarks, Lord of the Rings is indeed a very Catholic work, as its author believed. But in my humble opinion, it's more than that. It is this age's great Catholic epic. Uh, like the Grail legends, the Mort d'Arteur, the Canterbury Tales. It should be really a, a tremendous comfort to the individual Catholic and a tribute to the enduring greatness and power of our tradition that Tolkien made this, this incredible work. This era has seen a complete rejection of the faith by the civilization she created. And make no mistake, the civilization we lived in is the creation of the Catholic faith. It's gone completely haywire, but nevertheless, it's still there. And it's also true, despite the loss of the faith on the part of many lay Catholics and uncertainty among our hierarchy, nevertheless, with all of that, the Lord of the Rings assures us by its existence and its message that the darkness cannot triumph forever. And you know, this very theme of holding on to the truth and the faith despite the opposition, the seemingly overwhelming opposition of the world, the flesh and the devil for that matter, is a huge note in Tolkien's work. Uh, he has a, a couple of quotes I would like to uh, like to give you, uh, which I think are very important. They both reflect his worldview, and well, and the uh, orientation of Lord of the Rings. One is a letter from a letter he wrote to his son Christopher, who, alas, would lose the faith. Uh, one of the great tragedies of uh, Tolkien's life. He says, uh, actually, this was some my I said, Christopher, out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth, and more than that, death. By the divine paradox, that which ends life and demands the surrender of all, and yet by the taste or foretaste of which alone can what you seek in your earthly relationships, love, faithfulness, joy, be maintained, or take on that complexion of reality, of eternal endurance, which every man's heart desires. He wrote on another, on another occasion of the same son, the only cure for sagging or fainting faith is communion. Though always itself perfect and complete and inviolate, the Blessed Sacrament does not operate completely and once for all in any of us. 
Like the act of faith, it must be continuous and grow by exercise. Seven times a week is more nourishing than seven times at intervals. And that, of course, brings us back to Lemba's, as we mentioned before. The other thing I would particularly like to mention uh, comes directly from, from Lord of the Rings. And it's something that I, I think of a lot, frankly, these days. Quote, there, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, cold, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, that that that's an understanding that we need to internalize, especially today, when things do seem so dark and so hard and so difficult, when all of our leaders in church and state seem a bit confused at best, and some of them utterly criminal. We need to remember that it doesn't matter in one sense, that the beauty and truth of high heaven remain shining over us all, calling to us if we will cooperate with the graces that uh, heaven, especially through the Blessed Sacrament, continues to shower on us.